Hong Kong sits right in the heart of Asia, smack dab in the middle of all the action that happens here. And private equity investors have to think about how they can have the biggest impact in this massive region. Our next panel is going to be looking at private equity market strategies and what that means for how they invest and what it means for the execution of deal making in Asia. We've got a great panel coming up. They are going to be led now by Ganen Savarnanthan. Uh, Ganen is the managing partner, head of Asia and the Middle East at TPG. He's leading a great group up here. Are they ready for action? Gentlemen, on your feet and let's see you move. As they come up, we'd like to welcome Chip K, who is the CEO at Warburg Pincus. We have Zhang Lei, who is the founder and chairman at Hill House. And we have established that the other Zhang on the panel, Zhang Yicheng, is maybe his brother on this panel, but we're not raised in the same household by the same parents. Uh, but we would like to welcome Zhang Yichen, who is the chairman and CEO, of course, of True Star Capital. So ladies and gentlemen, this is your panel. And Ganen, take it away. Thank you, Andrew. Um, firstly, I got to thank the HKMA for uh, giving me so much power to be able to moderate all these people. It's a wonderful position to be in. But uh, no thanks to you for making me come up to moderate after Albert Go. Um, first piece of news, I have not done research in all three of you to bring your books. So I don't know what you've written. Uh, I also haven't done the research to figure out how much you've given away. Um, but we will try and uh, see what else we might be able to do uh, in this period. So just to introduce everyone uh, that we have today, uh, Chip Kay, uh, he actually started Warburg Pincus business uh, the same year my firm was founded in 1994. So 30 years uh, ago in Hong Kong, uh, now runs the firm uh, in New York, has named a successor who actually came from Asia. So the Asia feel at the Warburg Pincus headquarters will continue. Um, uh, we hope to be able to drink Jeff Pullman's wine, though, in Singapore uh, and, and make sure that he doesn't take it with him to New York. But that's, uh, uh, that's great to introduce Chip. Uh, Lei Chang uh, started his firm with $20 million from Yale 20 years ago, um, about 20 years ago. And, uh, and it's now 80 billion assets under management. So if there's anyone that needs uh, inspiration on the Asia miracle, uh, Lei uh, walks that. Um, and Yi Chen um, moved from New York to go uh, set up City Capital's business um, and now um, you know, runs it. Chaz McDonald's franchise in China, which is you know, one of the great private equity deals of all, um, also uh, is chairman of GNC and uh, has uh, an extensive portfolio uh, in, uh, in China. So we're going to um, really kick start with Chip. Um, you know, from the 94 to now, um, really, how's that experience been? And uh, what did Asia do for your own uh, sort of career running a firm from a, from a global lens? Well, thanks, Anand. First, it's, uh, it's always a great uh, pleasure to be back in, in Hong Kong uh, and to thank HKMA for the opportunity to do so. As I lived here for a good chunk of the 1990s, and two of my children were born here. So the place always has had a real, a real fondness for me. Uh, and uh, uh, a real treat as well to, to obviously be able to be a part of the panel with probably one of the first people I ever met when I got here, which was Ichen, uh, as well as uh, one of the people I've come to know more recently, but probably respects mo respect most in Lay. So uh, uh, a real, I'll, I'll, I take that as the greater source of pride than being on the last panel of the day. Um, so uh, um, the I was actually first in China in 1982, uh, actually be before I went to college. And I've witnessed sort of the transformation of China from a place that's almost, I still have memories in my mind of what it looked like then, but from a place that was, I don't know, a couple hundred billion dollar economy uh, and a couple hundred dollar per capita income to one that is now $18 trillion. And the, the physical transformation of it and the scale of it to me is always what has been um, most remarkable, and the chance to sort of witness and see what might be the one of the greater economic transformations in history is sort of one of the things I, I've um, 
It's been one of the sort of more interesting dimensions of my life. Um, obviously, over the last handful of years, what, what propelled that, that economic transformation, elements of the model and uh, the, the elements of that rapid you know, pace of 10% growth for 40 years, um, is, has created at some set of turbulence. Um, and there's a dimensions of uncertainty and there's sort of an inflection point. They're all trying to kind of grasp um, what comes next in, in all of this. Um, and I think one of the things I've benefited from by being at Warburg for almost 40 years and the firm itself going back to really being the oldest private equity firm in the world is to learn that, you know, great fortunes and great ideas come at the most uh, complicated moments. Um, there's the famous John Maynard Keynes quote that, you know, worldly wisdom teaches it's better to fail conventionally than succeed unconventionally. Um, and I think at moments like this, we sort of all need to kind of uh, recognize that um, uh, the, the, the scale of what's taken place today always brings with it a set of challenges that follow. And uh, those that persevere uh, and retool and repurpose and rethink and think about what the environment looks like ahead, there will be opportunity for. And I think for investors broadly around the world, for all the dimensions of uncertainty and complexity that have been talked about over these last couple of days. Um, it's a part of the world that, you know, it's a third of global GDP. It's twice that of global growth. And for many investors, it probably maybe even barely represents a double digit percentage of their asset allocation. And so I think for those that are here, uh, and um, there will be a place uh, for diversified investors that are trying to create consistency of return for whomever they're clients or fiduciaries or constituents will be. Um, and obviously, I live in the US. The US has benefited enormously uh, as a result of sort of the, the globalization uh, wave and the like. And uh, for most investors, it's, it's, it's not a negative commentary vis-a-vis -vis the US. But for most investors, that might represent 60 or 70% of people's assets relative to a quarter to a quarter GDP. So I think Asia represents a place that's still rather underinvested. Uh, both globally and in the context of what are rising pools of domestic savings. So um, I think the, the story is yet to be told as to sort of how the region will play out. And uh, obviously, Hong Kong will be an interesting perch from which to watch it all happen. Lee, the 20 million to 80 billion journey, um, you would have seen lots of different phases. Um, how do you feel about you know, the market environment now, what's changed, what's different, um, other than hoping that you buy all our portfolio companies, what, are you, what else are you focusing on? Uh, that's wonderful, thank you. I was thinking just, uh, Chip said earlier, that, you know, world wisdom saying that feel conventionally than succeed unconventionally, if you could put it in other words, actually, the best companies are built in the worst possible challenging times than the good times, actually. And you really think about the Asia uh, and had a very good run and it's in the pure time of investing was riding tight lifting all boats. Right now there are some uh, economic challenges and growth and slowing down here and there, but you're actually seeing greatest companies in the making in this pure time. Um, uh, I'm just going to give a couple examples of what we are seeing across our portfolio companies. Vast majority we are investing are really just traditional businesses. Many of them uh, face some headwinds, like uh, you know we bought a, you know the largest shoe retailer, and uh, you know in COVID people wear slippers; they don't need shoes, <laughs> high heels, <laughs> and, uh, and we, we bought a mattress company, and then the uh, the uh, real estate slow down dramatically. So in both cases, we're actually seeing companies doing very, very well, leveraging technology, uh, being very aligned with their employees, have long-term plan with their suppliers, with the distributors. Uh, that remind me, uh, when I started my career of uh, 1998, I was one well, of my mentor, he named Charlie Ellis, he wrote a book. He was, he was on, uh, on, on the chairman of Yale Endowment Investment Committee. He wrote a book called Winning the Loser's Game. 
that he basically saying that in the sports of tennis, if you observe, you don't have to be the strongest. All you have to do is be consistent, have steady hands, and wait for your opponents to have unforced errors. And the, in this environment, I, I'm trying to you know, really tell my management, you don't need to be super smart. All you need to do is be consistent, be long-term, steady hands, and do the right things. Actually, you can have a lot of market share to gain. And I'm, I'm seeing that across portfolio companies, uh, they are doing a very good job. And I, I really respect uh, those people who can walk through those difficult times and show leadership and continue to grow. And you know what? You know, it's cyclical. So when it comes back, they are much stronger and bigger companies. Yichen, you're, uh, you're a classic buyout person well ahead of your time in, in mainland China. I'm sure you've got lots of war stories, but you know, as you look back over your journey, um, you know, what would you say are some of the highlights that, that's, uh, that's, that's worth, uh, worth sharing here? Uh, I'm actually not sure if I have a whole lot of highlights. Uh, in fact, uh, my, uh, my journey, uh, uh, the overall city capital journey uh, is somewhat y unique in the sense that one, you know, in terms of shareholding, we started with a uh, SOE backer. And uh, so um, that, that over time obviously has evolved and now we are, you know, we have a mixed ownership even with uh, new shareholders, I mean, not, not so new anymore, it's eight years now with, uh, you know, Tencent and, and uh, Qatar and, and, you know, and so that's, that's why, you know, we, we launched a new brand called Trust Our Capital just to distinguish, especially in front of our international investors that, that the, 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 this firm is actually management controlled. Uh, second aspect is on the strategy part. You know, we, we started on a buyout strategy probably earlier than most. Uh, a lot of it is because of DNA, because I, 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 I joined Citic Pacific in year 2000 and started Citic Capital in 2002, but uh, because I was I was doing corporate investment, so so the uh, uh, the focus was more on buyout. But we, we honestly, if looking back, well, clearly we had the wrong strategy. Uh, it, that's why it's not a highlight. It, it, it's uh, uh, it was a struggle, you know, because uh, we we're trying to do buyout in a largely growth-driven market. Now, uh, but we toughed out. We persevered long enough. You know, the market is finally coming back to our strategy. So the, uh, the uh, you know, it started about 10 years ago when the economy started to slow down. You initially see value adjustment in the public market. That's why I started doing uh, public to private deals like, you know, Focus Media and a lot of those type of deals. And then uh, start doing corporate carve-outs like McDonald's and so on and so forth. So that's the second aspect on the strategy front. I think the third aspect is what we are all facing now is uh, that the Chinese market it, on the private equity side, uh, it's clearly, it, it, obviously it was on a great run. You know, you, you, you're, you're basically overlaying factors like, you know, tremendous economic growth, very cheap capital from international uh, uh, investors you, you, and the great entrepreneurs. You basically have all the stars who are aligned to create a, that sort of a return. But we all know all good things come to an end and, and the clarity we're, we're seeing now is the sort of the, the maturation of the Chinese market. Now, unfortunately, when it happens on the downturn, it's all the... I mean, it's a perfect storm. On the other side, you have geopolitical tension, you have slowing growth, you have regulatory challenges, and you know, the shortage of capital, it all happened at the same time. So you went from the peak straight down. And, and that adjustment itself may make people lose uh, sight of the fact that Chinese economy, Chinese private equity market overall is due to mature given you know, the GDP growth is no longer, uh, you know, 10%. We're talking about 3 to 5%. And this is the market uh, in which buyout 
strategies uh, uh, should be the main play, which is the case in the US, in Europe, in all the developed markets we all know, buyout strategy account for you know, 70, 80%. In China, you know, at this point, it may be 20%. So, so clearly, I think that buyout strategy is finally, maybe it's the, the time for it. Yichen, going back to you again, um, what do you see on the ground right now in terms of investing in the mainland? Because I think for a lot of the audience here um, who may not have a chance to, uh, to head to the mainland this time um, as they come through for this event, what are you seeing on the ground, uh, sort of the challenges today in deploying capital in, in private equity? Um, and what are you know, some of the green shoots that you're, uh, that you've, uh, you're, you're seeing right now? Uh, if you want to talk about challenges, how much time do you give me? So, <laughs> but uh, you know, in, in all seriousness, I think that clearly there are a lot of challenges. I'm not going to go into them. I, I mean, the Western press certainly talks to them enough about it. The, uh, the, but the interesting thing is, if you look at it, the data on the ground, you know, for example, we, have, we you know, we own McDonald's, so I get da daily data from it, and. Uh, even this year, I see you know over 20% growth, uh, and this is over 5,000, close to 6,000 stores, and uh, and you look at all the other data, travel data, it's it's above 2019 levels, and there 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 are many positive signs. Uh, what's weighing down the economy clearly, first and foremost, is real estate, uh, and I think it's still gonna take you know the overall economy is gonna take some time to re, you know. Uh, trying to wean itself off that, uh, but uh, the the basic consumption is by and large intact. So so that's the first uh, comment I want to make about the the the, econ the economy. Second, in terms of green shoots, uh, from an investment opportunity perspective, we're seeing a lot of uh, corporate carve outs. You know, multinationals wanting to reduce their exposure in China do not want to leave completely. So they are looking for uh, partners who can help them navigate better, or, or at least who can deflect some of the, uh, the geopolitical tension better uh, for them. And, uh, and then you also have a lot of Chinese groups uh, which are over leveraged and, and need to reduce leverage and sell assets. And, and you also gen have generational transition that uh, the first generation of Chinese entrepreneurs you know, need to retire and unlike you know, uh, Chinese families in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in Taiwan, uh, which tend to keep the, the business in, in the family, in China, unfortunately, the succession option is very limited. You have one child. If the, that child doesn't want to do it, you don't have a whole lot of option other than selling it. So that is, those are the opportunities that I see. <laughs> oh. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's great insights. Uh, Lei, let's, let's chat a little bit about your portfolio. I'm sure as you go around, everyone wants to know how resilient your portfolio is. How do you get better resilience in it? Um, you know, how, is it, are the valuations where they are right now, the bottom, you know, how, how do you ensure that there isn't any further downside? I think you know the drill, yeah, right? Sure. I want, I want you to quickly just follow up on Yi Chen's point on the opportunity set before I address my portfolio. <laughs> to advertise for Asia, I guess. Uh, the, um, in addition to the opportunities that Yi Chen um, uh, elaborated, I would add that uh, private credit is really also uh, taking off in Asia. You think of the opportunities that uh, Yi Chen talked about. Some of them need transitional capital. Some of that need intergenerational. They are not sure that they want to give out all the equity yet, but they need partners to work together. And people say, hey, in the US, private credit earns so high return, why Asia? I would argue that Asian company much less levered than US counterparts. Actually, they are they are uh, well positioned, and the, many of them uh, manage the balance sheets really uh, very conservatively, and there's higher growth potential. So I would say uh, private credit, performing credit, 
the new growth area for Asia. The other is special situations. And uh, as we know, there's uh, a more and more inter-regional collaboration. There's uh, a Chinese company going to Southeast Asia. There's uh, you know, a Korean company building uh, a business in America. There's n all number of opportunities that actually being a credit investor or in some difficult restructuring, you could be a part of that. So we are seeing, if you, I come back to the resilience question, we are seeing the lot of toolbox just start to open for the best company, for the entrepreneurs, for the opportunities that if you do a good job, there's a lot of things that could be available. That was, was you know, we were just purely, Asia was so much equity orientation. There's not so much other toolbox. I think there's, we're going to help those companies grow. So Chip, I'm going to turn the, the questions a little bit to uh, all the challenges the, 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 the rest of the three of us here face as we go out uh, to speak to the investor market um, all around. And, you know, main question is North American buyout has been such an attractive market. Why should we even bother putting money into Asia or China? If you give us your answer, we'll all use it now. <laughs> you know, I mean, so you look back, hindsight says, right, over the last 20 years, U.S. markets amongst major markets of the world have performed better than anywhere. So hindsight would say, put all your money in that. Then it would say, actually, actually, it's really like just tech, had you just done that. And then you say, no, 30 years ago, you should have bought one stock and gone home. Um, and that would... The reality is that's not the way the world works. You don't look at it in retrospect. You've got to think about it ahead. And uh, um, sort of the point I made earlier is the, the secret to preservation of wealth and managing money over time is diversification. We all have a habit of thinking we can predict things. We don't tend to actually be very good at it. And so if I think about us as a firm, you know, we have now a 50 plus year fund investing record the argument is more about consistency over time, and you achieve that through diversification across geography and sector and vintage and other things we're all learning. And I think the point I was trying to make earlier is, yes, China and Asia are going through their dimensions of complexity at the moment, but the reality is for a place that's a more than a third of global GDP and probably twice that of growth, you know, for most people I'd say it's like 10% plus or minus of where people's portfolios are. So the argument is, more about diversification of, than it is necessarily trying to pick. And again, my point is, it's not a, you know, the, the, the U.S. dynamics are positive and, and it's, you know, it's come out of the, it's come out of COVID probably higher, you know, um, higher trend to GDP than sort of anywhere else in the world and the markets are great and the companies themselves are quite global. One of the things people don't think a lot about is some portion of um, positive U.S. performance is that the corporate sector itself tends to play to great global trends. Again, this being a, this company being a really good example of that. So I think the, the argument to stay present and stay invested uh, in Asia is a powerful one. And I think what we're all living through as investors is frankly gonna be a real sorting out. There will be people who won't make it through this. And I think those places that can uh, stay committed um, think about how the environment's changed. I mean, China in particular was a very momentum-centric environment. I think Lei Chin both said it in different ways. And uh, a lot of that sort of has been given back. And so if you look over the last 20 years, 10 years it's probably flat, 20 years it's probably barely positive. Um, so um, uh, I think that shift is coming as people sort of understand more the mature private equity story that each end talked about. As we un better understand how China and Hong Kong capital markets evolve in ways that create more opportunity and more choice in terms of how our own private equity industry evolves. So um, I think that's the core story about why it still remains relevant to be present. Can I just quick comment? Sure. So I can't pass this opportunity to at, le at least, you know, make a a negative comment on the on the U.S. market, private, private equity market, is because if you look at it, even in the last uh, 20 years, I think a significant part of that uh, return was driven by leverage, uh, probably up to almost I, I don't know. There's one study saying it's 50% of the return actually driven by 
uh, low interest rate. And now interest rate is back up, so a major source of the, uh, uh, the, the return is gone. On the other hand, this is the first time that the interest rate in China is l in 40 years. It's so lower than in the U.S. And even for the foreseeable future, because there is, you know, lack of inflation in China, so there's inter interest rate is likely to remain low in China. Hence, you know, even from a larger perspective, you could see more return out of, you know, on, on private equity from, you know, from China than rather than from the U.S. I'll just, just uh, to, I was going to second each his point. I mean, obviously, um, we've got you know, sizable friends and the like, but the reality is, you know, I've been at Warburg almost 40 years, and I lived, Howard Marks made this point earlier, you know, I've, I've probably lived through 25 years of declining rates and 15 years of low rates, um, and um, many people haven't even seen any of those cycles through all of it, and, you know, as a private equity investor, you get to make money because you grow the underlying earnings of what you buy, you accelerate that through use of leverage, and you buy and sell at different multiples. And the third, to Ejen's point, has been a very powerful driver to the asset class for a pretty extended period of time. And we've all talked about over the last couple of days how that feels more at risk and may actually go the other way. The leverage thing matters less. The first is going to matter a whole lot more. And I think that's the, you know, just as we talk about sorting out here, I think that's the sorting out that's going to take place in the U.S. Who's creating real businesses that are genuinely profitable? And uh, so I think there's a different set of challenges for investors that are at play there. And I think Ejen's, you know, sort of spot on. I would add uh, what Chip said earlier on this uh, a couple of things. One is the if you look at the Asian growth engine, I think in the in the past there was a lot of demand driven. There was uh, uh, now we are seeing supply side consolidation. Where second we are seeing the management becoming more mature. I was I just met with a, a management team actually Pan Asia. Regional healthcare company actually owned by <laughs> by, by you guys, but uh, I was really impressed with the CEO. I mean, the way they they penetrate. You know, Pan Asia markets are fragmented. There's uh, different segments. How they are thoughtful. How they grow the business. I would say, you got this conservatively leveraged company, very little, but really still enjoy the high growth. I think that's the beauty of Asian companies. They are mostly well-managed balance sheet, even private equity-owned companies, by the way, <laughs> and, uh, and growth. And I was, I was uh, say, blown away by the growth of management team over the years that we are really seeing management talents now uh, than before. I, I don't know what you guys think. So like 10, 20 years ago, you, you don't see as much. Now you're seeing really good talents. Particularly, I was really impressed with what that particular CEO or the representation of the group who can be regional, who can be uh, penetrating different markets, who also understand leveraging technology for very traditional businesses. Like, this, it's not like rocket science. It's not like AI. It's not like it's a very traditional businesses. I would say I'm really yeah. impressed. I, I, I'll make a comment, uh, actually, something that Chip said years ago. I still, it still resonated with me. You know, Chip was making a comment that, uh, this is probably 20 some years ago. He said, okay, the perfect world for private equity investing is you have the natural resources of Russia, and you have the government of China, and you have a management talent from India. And, and uh, but over time, you know, what we have seen in China is, given how many multinational have come to China over the last 30 years, and the management talent they have trained, these days, you know, for us, it's night and day. Now the management talent pool, the operating talent that you can recruit, it's very deep. It's, uh, I would it's add this panel is fascinating. They don't <laughs> need a moderator. <laughs> I, no I, I, continue. Moderator I still needed. want to add <laughs> that I would, uh, I would say that, yes, uh, the, the, you, could have, uh, uh, you could have the best vintage in this period of time. That you, as you said, you've got to get a declining valuation entry in. You man and ended up the best vintage. That is the best summary because we needed to rebut Albert Goh's five and a half percent interest that he was happy to <laughs> live with. He was trying to put us out of business. <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's turn to um, crisis and um, ecosystems that kind of get secluded by it. I remember the 08 crisis, and I was getting depressed on the portfolio that I was running at the time that was, you know, multi-geography. But the place that I had my solace was China. 
because China kind of defied gravity then, right? Well, we now have another sort of ecosystem in India that seems to be having its, uh, uh, it seems to be kind of shining outside all of these problems. Chip, you, you've built a business there, you've been there for a long time. Um, you know, talk a little bit about that. Talk a little bit about how you moved Jeff to build the Southeast Asia business and how you sort of see those markets. Sure, you know, I, I've sometimes said if, you know, China's one of the great economic transformations, India's always been to be a fascinating kind of nation building exercise relative to the diversity of population across, you know, ethnicity, language, uh, and the like, and to be held together in the way that it has. Um, uh, the, the interesting observation I had about India when we first started there was unlike almost anywhere else, uh, as it sort of came out of its economic reform in the early 1990s, it had an incredibly high real cost of capital as a result of sort of administered uh, interest rates at the time. And uh, my observation as an investor is it did two fascinating things. One is assets tended to trade quite cheap. Um, reflecting that. The more interesting one to me was that management teams there had grown up with a high cost of capital, which meant that it was scarce and dear, and therefore they were very good at operating businesses with that and understood return on capital. In many ways, a little bit the opposite of what, you know, kind of Lei and Chen were talking about in China, where the flood of capital kind of created uh, a different dynamic. And so, uh, as a result, I think, you know, that's obviously played out over the last several decades, but the, the management talent pool that has longer history in India combined with sort of this sort of uh, discipline around understanding cost of capital, I think one of the reasons that the Indian stock market is one of the few, if you looked at over the last 10 years or 20 years, that would look pretty similar to the U.S. was. You know, it would be competitive in that sense. And so when you look at it, it's, it's stunning to look over the last 10 years where you'd probably say, you know, the U.S. and India look more like double-digit things. China looks like it's sort of flat. Um, but I think this, this, um, this sort of management talent depth and issues around cost of capital are sort of the underlying elements to it. And I think it sort of, it sort of ties back to the conversation that was happening earlier in that I think the generation of entrepreneurs that are now sort of growing up uh, in China and across Asia are sort of now learning that lesson. And we're now seeing them understand that capital isn't free. And there's a version of this that's happening in the U.S. as well, right? We've lived through a world where nobody asked anybody for the last 10 years what profitability was. We were worried about growth and revenue and capital was free. And uh, while we all understand that world's changing, the reality, it, it takes management teams time for that to change. So I think, um, you know, in, in many ways, kind of India led on that topic. But I think it's now interesting to see what's happening in China and especially in Southeast Asia where there's this next generation of entrepreneurs coming that have a, are more mature, that are deeper, more professionalized, better understand sort of some of the dynamics around business. And I think, um, you know, I think in Southeast Asia, you see differing versions of it. You well know it's hard to, it's hard to generalize. It's 10 different places with uh, many different dynamics uh, around it. But there's a series of pretty interesting stories as you wander through Indonesia and the Philippines and Vietnam and Singapore We're celebrating our 10th anniversary tomorrow uh, in Hanoi of being there. And um, I think, you know, part of what I think stays interesting about Asia besides the other elements we talked about is kind of this next generation. It's the uh, of entrepreneurs broadly um, that I think add to the dimension of the story. So we're down now to our last couple of minutes because all of you lost me time on the other questions as you <laughs> went off on your own. Um, I have no time for any of all of your questions because we're, you know, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna finish off with this. This is the last panel of this really, really important gathering of everyone. Your 2024 predictions around the Asia private equity markets and where it's gonna go. Yichen, we'll start with you. <laughs> okay, I think it's still gonna be a tough year uh, in China uh, because, you know, the, 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 the growth driver, uh, quite a bit of it, you know, f uh, to win the economy of real estate and, and to, you know, plug that hole with other industries uh, is going to take some time. And uh, 
So, but transformation at a micro level uh, is happening because clearly the businesses uh, are, will have to do with uh, uh, much less resources or capital. Uh, so I think 2024 is probably a year of recovery still. And, uh, and uh, the overall fundraising environment is still very tough for China. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to keep a steady uh, footing on the ground and I'm not, I don't have lofty uh, aspirations. Lake. Uh, building resilience for the existing portfolio, best vintage for private equity, in the next funds, <laughs> I think, next couple of years to invest in Asia, and the growth of Asia as, uh, in the across asset classes beyond private equity, private, private credit, real assets, infrastructure, we're gonna see a building up of new cl asset classes in the private uh, space. Wonderful contrast between those two in terms of the outlook. Where are you, Chip? I, okay. I think I think um, uh, the world is still coming to grips broadly with what I think are two big changes that none of us have seen in 40 years. We all touched on them. It's sort of what happens to the inflation rate story. And it's not that the new world isn't investable and manageable. It is. It's the transition from where we've been to there that will be painful. And the other is, you know, the geopolitical frictions that, that uh, the lack of them over the last decades provided a certain oxygen to growth. And I think now there's a set of challenges associated. I think for Asia, um, it is likely to be more, a more extended, what I'll call great sorting out. And I think this will test who has staying power of capital and confidence of investors to be able to manage through, who recognizes the reality of how the environment has changed and retools and repurposes and rethinks the strategy of how to be here and takes advantage and lays the seeds for what ultimately is probably another generation of pretty interesting, uh, successful stories that will come out. Well, we've run out of time. Uh, it's now with me to thank uh, our panelists today and to thank our hosts, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, for putting up such an amazing show for us this last couple of days. Uh, we hope that uh, you will have us back. Uh, I know these people were very ill-disciplined. I followed all the rules that you set me. I read the full memo that you provided. Uh, please have me back next year. <laughs> With that, thank you very much.